This video was brought to you by Brilliant, and the first 200 people to sign up using the link below will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. At the beginning of the war in Ukraine, we started making maps based on the situation on the ground. These maps very clearly and visually showed the changes taking place in Ukraine, Russia's rapid incursion, Putin closing in on Kyiv, and then the Ukrainian pushback, forcing Russia into a protracted conflict over Donbass. Throughout the conflict, we've documented these changes in successive map videos, where we've outlined the week-by-week -week changes on the ground. But the truth is that things are getting increasingly slow, and that's not expected to change anytime soon. In fact, between mid-April and the end of May, Putin's army was able to capture just 450 square kilometers of territory, which might sound impressive, until you remember that Ukraine's total area is 603,000 square kilometers, and that even just London is 1,572 square kilometers. So, with progress slow, let's discuss the limited progress made in the war this week. Before we go on to discuss why the conflict is becoming so protracted, and um, why we shouldn't expect that to change. Anyway, let's start with the developments on the ground. Since last week's Ukraine update video, the fighting has focused almost exclusively on Severodonetsk a small town with a pre-war population of about 100,000 people sitting northeast of the Siversky Donets River. Now, being just a small town, Severodonetsk doesn't have any obvious strategic value, apart from the fact that it's basically the last Ukrainian holdout in the Luhansk Oblast, the territory claimed by the Luhansk People's Republic, a pro-Russian separatist movement that declared independence from Ukraine in February. As we explained in our last video, Originally, it looked like the Russians were going to take the town relatively easily, with the Russian advance from the neighboring town of Rabizny making steady progress. But the tide began to turn after Ukrainian forces took fortified positions in the west of the town. At the time of writing, the battle for Severodonetsk is ongoing, with Ukrainian forces mostly concentrated in the west of the city. According to reports, there are now some 400 Ukrainian soldiers and as many as 800 civilians holed up in a chemical plant in the town. And it's not just any plant either. This is the largest chemical plant in Europe, at least according to its own website. And it's been under near constant shelling from Russian forces for the last few days, leading to at least one massive chemical explosion. But ultimately, it doesn't look good for the Ukrainians. The situation in the plant is now resembling what we saw play out in the Azovstal steelworks in Mariupol, insofar as the remaining Ukrainian forces are heavily outgunned with no way out. And that's because Russian forces have destroyed the four bridges that connect Severodonetsk to the nearest Ukrainian-occupied town of Lysychansk. Russia has claimed that they've set up a humanitarian corridor for the remaining Ukrainians in the plant on Wednesday, but it's unclear whether this corridor is available for soldiers as well as civilians, and ultimately the corridor leads back to Russian-occupied territory in Luhansk. So it doesn't look great for the people trapped inside. As a result then, it looks like Russia will eventually take Severodonetsk as they did with Mariupol, albeit at a massive cost to the Ukrainian army, which has suffered some of their heaviest losses over the last week or so. And if this does happen, the focus will almost certainly turn to Lysychansk, a town of a similar size to Severodonetsk that sits on the other side of the river. Now, it's worth saying that it will be a lot harder for the Russians to actually take Lysychansk with a frontal offensive as they did in Severodonetsk. And that's because the Russian army destroyed the bridges connecting the town. And while that might have stopped Ukrainians from crossing over, it's also going to stop the Russians, who have really struggled with river crossings historically. According to Ukrainian officials, Russian forces tried to cross the river nine times in mid-May, failing each time and losing 400 men and 80 tanks in the process. So if a frontal offensive isn't possible, they'll likely try and surround the town by advancing north from Popazna and Zoltoy, which sits about 25 kilometers south of Lysychansk. Zolotoy is currently controlled by Ukrainian forces, but it is surrounded on three sides, and the Russians will presumably try and get this town to retreat. 
But even if the Russians do take Lysychansk, this will presumably take another few weeks or so. Which brings us to the second part of this video, the slowing pace of the war. When the war began in February, Russian forces were traveling tens of kilometers each day. For example, it took the Russians a couple of days to travel 100 kilometers from the Russian border down to Kyiv. In recent weeks though, the pace of the Russian advance has slowed to less than a kilometer a day. Now, it's worth saying that this is consistent with other data from other conflicts. Historically, large-scale advances against well-prepared defenses move at between one and five kilometers per day. But nonetheless, the Russian advance is still on the lower end of this range, and it's decelerated significantly since the war began. So it's worth asking, why is this? What's slowing down the Russians so much? Well, as we see it, there are three reasons. Firstly, the Russians have given up on speedy mechanized assaults and instead are resorting to attritional artillery battles. Now, this does sort of make sense. The Russians have a lot more artillery than the Ukrainians, and most of the fighting is now concentrated in smaller areas of territory. So attritional warfare does make some sense. Secondly, the Russians have set up defensive positions in some of the occupied territory. Having realized that they're not going to take all of Ukraine, Russian forces in places like Kurzon have taken up defensive positions with trenches and barbed wire, which obviously makes it harder for the Russians to make further advances, but also makes it harder for the Ukrainians to counterattack, which is part of the reason why we haven't seen much news of significant Ukrainian counterattacks lately. The third reason is that at this point in the war, pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian populations have essentially segregated. Many pro-Ukrainian civilians will by now have moved to the west into Ukrainian-occupied territory, whereas many pro-Russian civilians will have now moved east into Russian-occupied territory. And this creates a sort of incumbency advantage for both sides. Russian forces will struggle to gain ground against more strongly pro-Ukrainian populations, and vice versa. Severodonetsk is sort of a middle ground. According to reports, the population is pretty evenly split between pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian, but it's a rarity in this respect, which is partly why further large-scale advances look unlikely. By this point, Ukraine has been segregated into a pro-Russian area and pro-Ukrainian territory, and therefore, permanent changes to this arrangement will probably require significant population shifts, which don't come quickly. Now, you might think that with the war slowing down, both sides will be keen to end it, but negotiations between the two sides are going equally slowly. Neither Zelensky nor the Ukrainian public want to cede the territory occupied by the Russians, and fair enough. While Putin has made it clear that he doesn't consider Ukraine a legitimate state at all. All in all, it looks like we should expect this war to keep going for at least a few more months with more and more casualties for smaller and smaller gains. Brilliant is an online STEM learning platform where you can learn everything you need to know to better understand the modern world. In fact, that's kind of what TLDR is all about too, taking complex subjects that seem scary from the outside and turning them into something more understandable and in turn, making the world a less daunting place. And understanding STEM better could mean all kinds of things for you. It could help you thrive at work, improve your grades at school, or even just help you learn something exciting and new. No matter what your reason is, taking some time to learn with Brilliant is a whole lot more fun than the boring computer science lectures that I had to take at university. There's no long talks and no textbooks. It's all about interactive experiences that have been put together by experts in their field to help you learn by doing. So if you want to take your next step with STEM and support the channel at the same time, then you can sign up to Brilliant. Then you'll want to use the link in the description. And the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for supporting the channel.